great British brother. Mm -hmm. oh, wait, wait. Thing off the screen. Yeah, you were a great uh, a British bodybuilder. I, I think you placed in the NABBA universe. I know you won the, uh, was it the Mr. Britain or, or a Great Britain Championship? Yeah. I don't yeah. Exactly. I'm absolutely familiar with you. Sure. You were a great, great <clears throat> one of in Britain. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, you, you were good friends with Peter McGuff, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Peter McGuff, I knew pretty well. Yeah. I worked with him at the Weeder office, uh, got along. We used to go on trips together, him and his wife, and you know, as part of the Weeder crew. I got to know him pretty well. Yeah. yeah. He, he took over, though. By the time Weeder made him head of all the magazines, uh, I was already gone. You know, I. Oh, I really? Had, it wasn't anything. To, I always got along with Peter. There was a cut. There was a new guy named Vince. I can't remember his last name. Uh, this guy had a real problem with me because Joe Weeder liked me too much, and oh, he wow. started treating me like garbage. I mean, you know, really bad. And, you know, I complained to Joe. Joe interceded a couple of times for about two years. And then one day I get a call from Joe and Joe says, uh, Jerry, I'm just not going to fight with these guys anymore. And I said, I understand, Joe, you know, and I just, that was it. I never, never wrote from him again. <laughs> wow. Interesting story. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Sean, Sean Pierre Fuchs was supposed to be on and he, he clicked on for a second. He had an emergency, so he couldn't make it, oh. but he. He, he says he uh he says try to get him on again i really want to talk to him so okay well, I yeah. Know Gene. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah he's a regular part of the show so uh jerry again thanks for coming on and just a kind of a quick introduction for those or the viewer our viewers don't know who you are basically you've wrote thousands of magazine articles for how many magazines have you wrote for well if you include all of them around the world and you know the foreign editions of the Weeda magazine, Iron Man, mm -hmm. probably about 25 wow. different magazines. Wow. Include... Wow. Oh, there's my dog. Damn it. Hmm. Oh, stop. Oh, man. I'm afraid of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We uh, we always have little. Usually we're doing, dealing with Sean Pierre's cats. So it's okay. Let yeah. well, me just move him in the bedroom. Go ahead. Always will keep barking throughout the whole thing. Hold on. Give me one second. Hold on. No problem. Hold on. Hold on. He's a yapper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ian, did Ian, did you guys ever get another dog after your one passed? No, we, 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 we had two pit bulls. Now we've only got one. Oh, okay. It, it's long way, so I think Max talking about getting another pit. Yeah. I love pit bulls. They're good. I like pits too. I've never owned one. I've always wanted to get one. Of course, I've always had shepherds. You know, with my oh, work really? and stuff. Yeah. I've yeah. always, but I haven't had a shepherd since my service one passed away. So now I just have a little. It's hard when dogs die. It is. I, I thought it was gonna, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, it devastated me when when Tebow died. Yeah, I mean they're they're your kids, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let me just pick put these back in here. Mm -hmm. Like if you, all right. That dog that you guys just heard. You know that dog. I feel. I think Phil knows this. Yeah. That he's a little chihuahua mix. You know, he's a mutt, as they call it. Mm -hmm. That dog. Are you ready for this? I'm glad you're all sitting down. Twenty-three years old. Wow. Really? <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, it's. I've had him so long. I don't even remember when I got him. You know, but he almost died recently. He had a severe kidney infection, and you know, he, like you guys were uh -huh. just saying, look at this dog. At like he's my child. I spent a, a lot of I spent uh, like twelve thousand dollars in vet bills, but it saved his life, and he's doing great now. I mean, mm -hmm, he's, mm -hmm. he has arthritis in his hips and his legs. He doesn't walk that good. I mean, he walks fine, but he doesn't like to walk long distances, you know. So I take him for sure. But when he does walk, he walks like you know you wouldn't even know how old he oh, is. So he so, sounds just pretty spunky for a twenty-three year old. He really is. He's blind and deaf, but yeah. <laughs> you know anything about dogs? They have a sense of smell that uh, depends on which book you look at. Mm -hmm. and a thousand to a hundred thousand times yeah. more sense than a human. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, even blind and deaf dogs actually do very well. You know, you know he bumps into things sometimes. I gotta mm -hmm. be careful, you know, because he can't see. But uh, mm -hmm. he, he does pretty well. God bless him. You know. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. I've never heard of any dog living to twenty three. No, we had a we had a poodle that lived to be eighteen. My mom had when I was a kid growing yeah. up. Yeah, little dogs tend to live longer than big dogs, and you know they know the reason now why. It's a strange reason because 
uh, the number one killer in dogs, in, in humans, the number one is cardiovascular disease. Uh, the second is cancer. In dogs, it's reversed. In dogs, the number one killer is cancer. And what happens is uh, larger dogs, they get, the reason that they're bigger is because they secrete more of a hormone. You guys are probably all familiar with insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. But that also shortens their lives and also makes them have a t greater tendency to get cancer. Mm -hmm. And that's why bigger dogs, don't, and the, they're small, they secrete much less IGF-1. And they live sometimes, you know, two, three times longer than the big dog. Yeah. I think it's the average lifespan for a Great Dane, which is a huge dog, I think it's seven years. It's pretty seven years, Jerry. Yeah. yeah. And this is a reason why I love all dogs. Don't get me wrong. My father, he absolutely adored dogs. He had dogs from the time he was 12 years old till he died. He used to like German Shepherds. Always had German Shepherds. That's me. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, he uh, uh, he used to say to me uh, uh, when I was 19, I remember. I always loved animals, but I didn't have any animals myself. You know, I was always running around. And when I worked for Weeder, I was going all over the place. I didn't, couldn't have any animals. But the thing is, uh, he always did. And uh, when I was 19, I remember he said to me, I like dogs better than people. And I, I remember looking at him thinking, geez, he's nuts. He's crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what kind of statement is that? Mm -hmm. Now, after all these years, I'm having a couple of dogs over the years. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. You know who else is a big animal lover? Dorian Yates. I didn't know that. that yeah, right? well, I interviewed Dorian. That was I got. We started talking about animals, and I think we talked about animals for thirty minutes. I know his and his sister is a like a pro horse rider, and he's really big into horses and all that. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Yeah. But uh, you know, the thing is, uh, the reasoning. Again, I don't want to sound anti-social, but if you got you guys, you if you know if you love dogs, you understand already. But. Uh, I think it's because, you know, you were running to people in your life that you think are your friends who will stick a knife in your back or abandon you when you're down. Women, mm -hmm. too, mm -hmm. especially women. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> but the dog, the dog stays loyal to you <clears throat> from the time you get him to the time he dies. He's 100% loyal. There's 100% integrity. I, and that's one of the things I love about dogs. They really, truly love you unconditionally, yes. you know? So I, I, I get in arguments with people because I always tell them, you know, uh, even in human relationships, I mean, let's say a man and a woman, it's not unconditional love. In other words, you might think it is, but it isn't because unless you have something she wants or she has something you want, yeah. you're not going to be with her. That's a condition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Always conditions. Always conditions. And, 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 you know, dogs don't give a crap what you look like, whether you're fat, whether you're muscular. They don't care. They just love you. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I love all dogs. Well, Great mm -hmm. Danes, tiny dog. I, I've only been bit once. And it was, and I'm sorry, I was bit twice. And strangely enough, it was the same uh, breed. It was Dash, Dashu. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Yeah. Uh, I, it was an old lady walking to Dashu one day. And, and you know, I, mean, I like dogs. I I went down to, to pet the dog. I said, I asked her first, I said, is it okay to pet your dog? And she just says, yeah. So I bent down. As soon as I, my hand was in front of the dog, didn't even pet him yet. He, he dug his nails right into my hand. <laughs> and, you know, and so my hand was, you know, was bleeding. And I looked up at the old lady and, and uh, I, said, I said, I thought you said he didn't bite. And she just shrugged. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he does now. <laughs> it wasn't a serious bite but uh, you know yeah. it happened it happened once more with another, another dash a, a really old dash and looked like he had no teeth i went to and I'm, again he dug his teeth you know so now i, I have a, a, a now for sure i try believe me guys i will never ever you know pet a uh a, a can you hear me oh, oh what yeah. i do i still hear you oh, you hear me okay yeah you might shut your earpiece off or something. Okay. Yeah, no, I had my hand on the uh, little dial for the sound. So, I, yeah, I'm okay now. Anyway, that's my experience. So, my point mm -hmm. being that mm -hmm. I love dogs. You know, makes mm -hmm. it, I think, the greatest animal. I love all animals. Mm -hmm. I'm like oh, an animal activist, I guess. you. I mean, I get, it, nothing hurts me more than to see mistreatment of any kind of animal. Yeah, Even yeah. I don't like to see it. You know, it just, mm -hmm. it bothers me. Let them live. Let them live on their own. I, I, I mean, I, I want to be a, a vegan, you know, a, a vegetarian, but the thing is, I, I'm like about 90% uh, vegan. In other words, I cut out meat a couple of years ago. 
Uh, the only meat I eat is a little bit of chicken and I give most of it to my dog. So I, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the amount of chicken I eat would be equivalent to like a, a meatball. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm living mm -hmm. free. Most of my protein I get from like whey protein drinks. Mm -hmm. I do eat eggs. I eat eggs about three, four times a week. That's mm -hmm. it. That's my protein sources. Yeah. So, okay. Jerry, how many, uh, speaking of like nutrition and all that, how, how many athletes and who have you worked with? Well, you know, I, I, offhand, I couldn't tell you the exact number, Okay. but I was, I was very active involved in that in the nineties. Okay. Uh, before that with bodybuilders, I worked with starting from the seventies, you know, and uh, I worked, you know, a couple and then I, in the, I worked horses for a couple of guys in the seventies, mm -hmm. the eighties. I actually worked with a couple of guys. Uh, I helped out Phil a little bit, you know, and this and that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Flex Wheeler says I saved his life. It's a long story, but you know, the thing is, uh, I started working with professional elite athletes from other sports in the nineties. And I got involved in that. Is that my dog still barking? Is that me? Yeah, that's him. That's all right. Yeah, all right, anyway, all right. you're good. Uh, so anyway, the th I don't know what he's barking. The thing is, uh, I, uh, boy, this microphone is sensitive, isn't it? I mean, it puts him up in the other. Anyway, <laughs> the thing is, uh, I saw I got together with a guy you probably you guys I'm sure all know you probably heard of John Park John John Park mm -hmm. Reg Park's son we you know we we were friends and uh, you know he had a private training gym in West Los Angeles and we started working with athletes uh, mostly professional boxers you know and I I did a couple of other athletes on my own some uh, hockey players baseball players but with John John we worked with professional boxers. Uh, quite a few of them. There was a guy, uh, you know, I, I, the main one was uh, Oscar De La Hoya. I was a nutri nutritionist for three years. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, and I worked with, uh, the first guy was a guy named David uh, uh, Kamal. David Kamal. He was a uh, feather, I believe he was a featherweight. Uh, he was the first fighter we worked with. And I, we, we trained him for a fight with a, a legendary boxer named uh, Cesar Chavez. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Mexico. Yep. He lost the fight, but you know, a lot of people felt he should have won, you, you know. But Chavez was such a legendary champion that they gave him, you know, they gave him the uh, the decision. You know, he never knocked out. You know. The interesting thing about David Kamal, that was the first fighter I worked with, was that, you know, his, uh, his managers took me aside. They told me that his problem was that he lost, he, he would lose wind, he loses endurance after about three rounds. He, you know, there was, his punches weren't coming as fast. So I questioned David Kamal on his diet, and and I, uh, and I God, he's not gonna stop. I asked him, uh, you know, he believe it or not, he was living on a type of. Uh, he was from Kenya, and you know, he told me when he was growing up, you know, the Kenyans are famous for like, their long distance running ability, right? Mm -hmm. he, he used to go to school as a child. He used to run ten miles to school and ten miles back every day. That's twenty miles a day. He ran as a child. <coughs> wow. <laughs> His endurance was tremendous, but the problem was that he lived on this uh, a kind of a porridge that was made in Kenya. And when I asked, I don't remember the exact ingredients, but when I asked him about it, it turns out that it had very little protein. The guy was just about protein deficient. And I, I, I was amazed that he was as much, he was a pretty hard puncher. I, I, I was amazed that he could actually survive on, on that food. That's all he ate. The mm -hmm. guy was six foot tall and he weighed under 140 pounds. Mm -hmm. You know, he's fit. So what I did, we did what I did, I put him on a high protein diet, some supplements, and it was a huge difference. The guy, I mean, endurance all the way through to the 10th round. Mm -hmm. So we, we worked with him and then we worked with a couple of, I don't even, I remember working with a, Then it's, it's been a couple of years, I don't remember the exact names, but there was a guy who was a light heavyweight. Uh, he was from Kazakhstan. Can't remember his name offhand. Um, he was actually voted the best boxer in the 19, uh, I believe it was in, uh, the Olympics, 19, uh, was it 19? Was that Vasily Jarov? That's it, Jarov. Yeah. Very, yeah. very good for your boxing. Mm. It was Jarov. I worked with Jarov. He was a super nice guy. Very nice guy. Very quiet guy, but the nicest guy you can imagine. I, I really liked him personally. All of them were great guys. But, you know, it was, it was a fun time. You know, I, I basically did the diets for these guys and I gave them certain supplements. And I think that's what really made a difference between mm -hmm. me and, for example, if they worked with a registered dietitian, 
the dietitian would just give them a menu, you know, and they <clears throat> dietitians aren't big on supplements. Right. Uh, some of these supplements really aid athletic performance, you know, like creatine and, and some and in some cases the whey protein. I gave them the athletes these supplements. I gave them certain supplements, the boxes to help prevent brain damage or, or minimize it, like fish oil and and, uh, and there was another one called NADH that supposedly helped to prevent Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. and this and that. So, you know, I gave him a lot of uh, special, uh, uh, one interesting story with uh, De La Hoya, when he was going to fight Chavez for the second time, uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, Chavez was saying a lot of bad things about Oscar. You know, he was calling him a homosexual, this and that, you know, he's in public, he was, you know, mm -hmm. and, and De, La Hoya, De La Hoya was really pissed off. So he came to me and he says, can you give me a supplement that'll make me really aggressive? Because I want to beat the shit out of this guy. I want to, I want to fuck out his face, he goes. So at the time, they were coming out with these, you guys might remember the pro-hormone supplements. Right. And, I, and there, was one, there was one or two of them that I knew would increase aggressiveness. You know, So I gave him this stuff. Mm. I gave it was probably them. Andro or something, huh? It was Andro. It was yeah. Andro. Yeah. It was yeah. pretty good. It was Andrew. And sure enough, he pummeled the guy. I mean, he messed up his face just like he wanted. As a matter of fact, that that I still remember that fight because he made weight. I, I can't remember. Was it a what I can't what was it maybe it'd been a welterweight fight? I don't remember. He made weight, and then right after the weigh-in, I would be off stage, right? As soon as he got off the scale, and I'd hand him a, a, a like a, a, a weight gain drink, you know, because he was dehydrated to make weight. You know, he had to make weight. I would give him like a protein drink or a weight gain drink, such as specifically with a couple other things added. And he said to me, he, I said, I'd always ask him the same question. Oscar, what do you want to weigh for this fight? Now, I, let's say the weight limit was uh, 140. I'm just, I don't, I'm guessing this is one so long ago. I said, what do you want to weigh for the fight? He says, uh, as much as possible. He says, as much, maybe 158. So he wanted to gain 18 pounds in 24 hours. Mm. <laughs> Now, now, you have to understand, when he was weighed, he was completely dehydrated. You know what I mean? He, he, had, he had, I didn't restrict liquids. All I did is put him on, I'll tell you what I did. I just put him on a, on a, a low carb diet for the three or four days before the weigh-in. All you guys know that low carb diets have a natural diuretic action. You lose a lot of water. And so I didn't restrict water. You don't want, you don't want to restrict water because that makes a person weak. So I, all I did is limit the carbs. He made the weight. He says to me, once we 158. So what I did is I started, I gave him weight gain. I had, a couple, we, me and another guy went to a local, uh, health I think this is in Vegas. We bought a bunch of weight gain powders. I mean, these things had so many calories. I remember one serving of one of these things had something like 1,200 calories in a serving. Oh, boy. So we, I was giving him the weight train. I'm not exaggerating. I was giving him like every hour and a half you know, about maybe eight ounces of the weight gain. And I threw in other things, you know, a couple of extra amino acids. I wasn't really sure, to be honest with you, that I could get him to 158. But sure enough, on the day of the fight, <laughs> they had a little scale in the dressing room and they weighed him, uh, you know, they weighed him. It was unofficial though. You know, this is not the official, it's already done. Mm -hmm. And he got on the scale, he was 159. Wow. Jeez. That's crazy. Actually, just he was a, mid, a middleweight i mean <laughs> so you combine the all the weight he put on plus the aggressiveness of the andro and you know he just beat the crap if you ever look at the uh you can look at it on uh, youtube you can see he was punching the hell out of shadows mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a bloody mess yeah so so i, I succeeded in giving him what he wanted <laughs> mm. jerry what's your what's your background how did you get all, all your knowledge uh, actually, it's what they call autodidactic learning. In other words, <clears throat> I didn't get a, uh, a university degree. I don't have a uh, you know a PhD or an MD or anything like that. Uh, what I did is I started. It has to do with a man who just died yesterday. Got Bill Pearl, who died at ninety-one. What happened was Bill Pearl was my idol when I first got into bodybuilding. I was uh, I think I was twelve years old. I saw a picture of Bill Pearl's tri some famous side tricep shot of him in a Strength and Health magazine, it was called. I know in Britain, it was called Health and Strength. It was a different magazine. Yeah. <laughs> called Strength and Health here in the United States. I looked at this photo and the caption said, this is Bill Pearl. 
Mr. America, Miss Universe, who sports 21 and a half inch arms. I, I said, whoa. I said, I couldn't believe, I've never seen a human arm like that. 21 and a half, that was like the size of my leg, bigger than my leg at the time. I was a kid, you know? So I, I <clears> basically <throat> started, I, I contacted Pearl. He was selling a bunch of courses, which I did, just found out the other night. He revised these courses. It's actually sell, sold on his website, but it was like, of course, like fabulous forearms, building bulk and power, building big arms. I sent to them, and in the courses, he mentioned, uh, he was talking a little about nutrition. He recommended a book called Let's Eat Right to Keep Fit by a nutritionist named Adele Davis, who was a big nutritionist in the early 60s. I read the book, and I was just fascinated by nutrition. I didn't know much about it before then, but from that time on, from 12 years on, 12 years on, I read and studied everything I could about nutrition as I learned, I got more and more advanced and I just remembered everything I read. So what you have here is basically 60 years of accumulated knowledge of uh, now, of course, I read a lot of academic nutrition, you know, the medical papers, because I have a publication called Applied Metabolics, where I, I write about a lot of research and stuff like that. So uh, I'm kind of like, you can say I'm on the same level as somebody with an advanced degree, although I don't have an advanced degree. As a matter of fact, uh, I am I, I'm in some ways I, I, I'm a little bit different than these guys because they are a lot of their knowledge is rote learning what they learned in school and you know if they if they didn't learn in school they're not open to it so I'm I'm more open to new let's say new developments in nutrition whereas they might say well there's no proof uh, blah 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 so I'm a little bit different than them so basically and you could say I, it was basically self-taught knowledge Self-taught You were a competitive bodybuilder, right? Excuse me, what? You competed as a bodybuilder in your yes, younger days. Yeah, I started competing in the when I was about uh, I think it was 16. Uh, I competed in the back east in New York. Uh, first contest was called uh, it was held up in Harlem. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, it was as named after some local center. Uh, and and uh, it actually was Lou Ferrigno's first contest, too. He competed like Two, two years after me, though, I, I went into this contest. Wagner Youth Center was called. So it was, it was called Mr. Uh, Teenage Mr. Wagner Youth Center. I know it's a weird title, but that's the first contest. I, I, could, I could tell you a funny story from that contest. You know, it was all teenagers. I was 16. I, most of the guys were, you know, 15 to 17. You know, we were all backstage getting ready to compete. And this guy walks in, black guy walks in. And right away, I looked at him. I knew there was something different about this guy. And I, you know, I, 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 I took a look at it because I was looking at the magazines a lot and I recognized this guy, but I didn't recognize it at first. He took off his, uh, you know, he started to strip down to his posing trunks. And this guy was like, it looked like a professional bodybuilder, vascular. He was like 10 times better than any of us. And I said, and I said to the other guys, what is, is he going to be like a guest pose? There's no way this guy's competing in an amateur novice contest. There's no <laughs> way. Uh, I'm sorry. There's no way. It turns out the guy's name was Warren Frederick. You remember Warren Frederick? Yes, I do. <laughs> and strangely enough, this guy had already won, I think, well, maybe a year or two later, he wins Dan Lurie's Mr. America contest, right? He's trying to sneak into yeah. a novice contest for teenagers. Like, I didn't want to be a rat. I didn't turn him in. But within about 10 minutes, one the judges, it turns out one of them was familiar with bodybuilders and recognized Warren Frederick and threw him out of the contest because if he would have been, I mean, it would have been like a slaughter. I mean, and what was his reason? Just to just to show up, just to do it, or what? Well, he, he lived in the neighborhood. Oh, okay. I mean, he, well, I guess. So. <laughs> you know, yeah, he said, yeah, "Why not?" Yeah, you know, like, like just on a whim, he figured, oh, "I'll just walk a couple of blocks and compete in this contest." I, I think, I, I think though, I, to, to his defense. I don't think he knew it was a novice teenage contest. It actually wasn't a teenager. It was called a novice contest, meaning for, you know, big, first timer. First timer. Yeah. I don't think he knew it was. I think he just thought it was an open contest. So, you know, it was his mistake. You know, he, he took it good. You know, he just, you know, put his shirt back on and went and sat in the audience. Mm -hmm. I didn't win the contest. I didn't even place. Uh, I don't think that Louis, Louis Ferrigno, who entered it two years later, the same show, I don't think he placed either. I mean, so, you know, I mean, I only had like a couple of years of training. 
I didn't know how to pose. I wore bad posing shorts, just like the mistakes everybody else made. So I wasn't really ready to compete. Now. But you know, that's the way it goes. I think if, if there was a place- I, I got your picture here. What happened, here, something happened? Here, here you are. There you go. Here it is. Yeah, your picture. Okay, that was taken, that was taken in 74 at a Venice Beach uh, bodybuilding contest. Mm -hmm. That was, uh, that was uh, probably the most successful years I competed. I, 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 uh, I won it, uh, not that year, but a couple of years before I'd won Teenage Mr. Southern California, uh, a junior California. And I, I got uh, something like second in a Mr. Western America. Uh, but that was at a, yeah, that was at a beach contest. And, you know, that was taken by Artie Zella. That's probably the best bodybuilding photo of me ever taken sometimes i you know i put it on it's in my newsletter uh, you know this uh biography page and i'm always accused uh, of these trolls they always say i took a lot of steroids and you know you can't get any kind of muscle without steroids and the guy on his truth the hand on the bible i was on no steroids none when i competed i took no steroids for one simple reason because I had read that steroids could possibly make you go bald, right? Now, this is the 70s. In the 70s, baldness, unlike today, was not in. It was considered a stigma. Guys would practically commit suicide if they started to lose it. You know? so I, I didn't want to lose my head. And to top it all, both my grandfathers, I knew there was a genetic component. Both my grandfathers were bald by the time they were 30. I said, if I take steroids, you know, and I knew a couple of guys my age who had taken steroids and had lost their hair. Mm -hmm. So that, believe it or not, was the main reason why I wasn't worried about any health, other health problems. I didn't take the steroids because I was afraid of losing Just my Just to hair. go bald. <laughs> yeah, now today, the funny thing is, if this happened today, you know, I wouldn't care because bald, nobody cares about baldness mm -mm. anymore. It's nothing. I mean, every other guy in the gym I go to, and the ninety percent of the guys are uh, bald or shaved. Head. Nobody can. Women don't give a crap. Mm -mm. Nobody cares. It's no. It's considered in, you know. But it wasn't back then. Back then, it was considered a big stigma, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's mm. a funny reason not to take steroids because I was afraid mm -hmm. of losing my. Head. I never heard that one before. Was uh, was Bill Pearl natural? Bill, oh, that's an interesting story. I mean, the guy lived to ninety one. Right, he lived in 91, and here's the deal with Bill Pearl. Bill Pearl, if you look at photos, and then the, 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 you know, because the man just died, they're putting a lot of uh, photos of online now. Mm -hmm. If you look at photos of him when he, when he won the Mr. America contest, which was in 1953, I mean, he had a very, very light physique. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you guys ever heard, there's a guy named Seymour Koenig, who is a, uh, a bodybuilder pro wrestler known for his abs. He was a good friend of mine. He competed at that time in bodybuilding and competed against Bill Pearl. You, you okay? Yeah, I got him here. I was pulling his picture up. Oh, yeah. That's Bill Pearl later. But when he competed in 53, he had this very light physique. And I asked Seymour Koenig, I said, because he actually competed against him that year. So I said, Seymour, how did Bill look in person? Because in the photos, he, he doesn't really have much muscle. So he said to me, all of, all of the other guys in the contest, me, Zabel, Kazuski, all the other bodybuilders, we thought, thought he looked like a swimmer. He didn't even look like a bodybuilder. He had very small arms. He, didn't have, he had a small waist, but no muscular definition at all. But he won, you know, when you look at the photos, I tried to figure out how this guy won. And, what he, the re, and I looked at the other guy. So, hey, there it is, that one there. You were in the center where it says classic body. That's kind of what he looked like when he right won the American. A little, a little lower. Uh, right here. Where, you know, there's, there's one mm -hmm. underneath where he's standing relaxed, one right above that where he's, it says Bill Pearl Classic Bodybuilders, old bodybuilder, Mr. Lindsay. Mm. Uh, go, go up, Mark. Go up, Mark, Jason. Scroll up above that one that you're on. Right here. Hey, that's it. Yeah. That's, that's basically the physique he had when he won the Mr. America. Now, right. now if you look at that, I mean, you could see why the other guy, and he had some muscle on him, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I mean, he was a young guy. He was about 22, 23 years old. Uh, and the thing is, the other guys in the show thought he was a, looked like a swimmer. But the reason he won, if you know, if you see the other photos of the guys he beat, like Zabo and these other guys, uh, he had the best symmetry. In other words, the other guys had, you know, Zabo was more muscular than him. 
Uh, George Payne, a, a black body blue for men, was much more muscular in Bill Brooks. In fact, he won the most muscular award, much more ripped, but none of them had the top to bottom symmetry. Bill Pearl's arms, his torso, his legs, everything matched. And that's, he won the Mr. America on his symmetry and proportions, not muscle size. He became famous for the muscle size. This is getting, answering your question about the steroids. He had that kind of same look all the way through. He won the 1956 Miss USA. Again, nice physique, but not really what you consider big. That year, same year, he went to the Nabi Universe and he lost the, the uh, he lost the professional. He had already won the 53 Nabi amateur. He competed in the, in the professional Nabi in, in 56, lost to American bodybuilder Jack Dillinger, who had won the Mr. America. I believe it was 48. I might be wrong about that. But he lost to him. And then uh, he kind of like stayed low for a while. Uh, and then he, he reappeared in 1961. He went back to the NAB universe and he easily won. From what I understand, he got every first place vote. But here's the point. His physique in 61 was radically different than it was the last time he appeared. Well, what happened in the interim, and this is Bill Pearl himself talking, he had a gym up in Sacramento, California, his first gym. Not far from his gym was a was a was one of the best veterinarian universities in the country. Uh, it, it was up there, I can't remember. The University of California, Davis Veterinary School. Uh, one of the veterinarians, one of the veterinarians, uh, veterinary researchers trained at Bill Pearl's gym and they had a discussion one day and the veterinarian says to Bill Pearl, Bill, there's this new drug out that puts a lot of muscle on animals. You know, he says, I don't know how it would work in humans, but if you want, you know, I know that you're, you know, your body, you might want to try it. And, uh, and he told them how much to take. The name of the drug was Nilovar. Nilovar, it was an oral anabolic steroid. Bill Pearl claims he took oh. two tablets a day because that's what the uh, veterinary uh, uh, researcher told him to take. Anyway, you know, the rest is history. He goes and wins the 61 universe. After that, he got bigger and bigger and, you know, he became the Bill Pearl that most people are mm -hmm. familiar with. But here's the interesting thing. Here's the interesting thing, Jason. I knew Bill Pearl very well. As I said, I, I wrote to him for three years after uh, I bought his courses. We had a correspondence. You know, I, I, I knew the guy. Uh, so later on, he had a gym in Pasadena. He had a gym in Pasadena, right? This is where Doug Bagnoli started uh, working out. I went, uh, one day I was up at his gym. It was just me and Bill Pearl in his office. He was sitting behind his desk. And I said, Bill, there's no one around here except you and me. I said, and this is right, right before the 1971 NABI universe. Right. Where he reached your leave and right. This was the last one he won, right? And he was in fantastic shape, you know? And I said to him, Bill, there's no one here but you and me. I've known you for years. You were my childhood idol, as you know. I said, I don't understand why you say you never use anabolic steroids. I mean, you know, you, you know you're such a likable guy, but it creates a, a problem in my mind because I look at you and, you know, everybody else does. Nobody really believes that you don't use anabolic steroids. So he said something to me that he never said in public. What he said to me was, Jerry, he says, the reason I say that, he says, see the way you looked up to me when you were a young kid? You know, you looked up to me. I was your bodybuilding idol. And I said, yes. He says, there's a lot of young guys like you. If I come right out and say I use steroids, they're going to try and emulate me. And they could ruin their health. And it would really make me feel bad. It would be on my conscience. So, yeah, I do. I, I, I give a little white lie. I say I don't use steroids. Just basically, I'm just trying to protect these young guys. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to get sick. And I accepted that. I accepted that. I didn't ask him what he took. So I don't know what he really took, but as far as I know, Bill Pearl never went crazy on the steroids. He always took smaller amounts. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. He never, uh, uh, you know, took yeah. the huge cycles of doses that, you know, I mean, Bill Pearl, I mean, I know he, he'd be horrified if he knew what the guys today were using. I mean, you know. Well, he was never really like a, a, a mass monster, right? He was more symmetry. He was more symmetry and yeah. he had pretty big bumps and he was never... Another tip off that he wasn't a heavy steroid user mm -hmm. is that he was really ripped, except for his ab ab abdominal area. Mm -hmm. He had good abs, but his back, remember Phil, his back was, he had some lat development, but he didn't have like the Phil Williams. I mean, Phil's back will put him to shame. You know, I mean, 
he, and he didn't have he didn't have that kind of super hard look that you get with the steroids. Yeah. So if he took steroids, I believe he took very moderate to low doses. And I do think he took steroids for that 71 show because he did look fairly muscular for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and that he actually he actually looked harder in that show. If you look at photos, he looked harder in that show than Sergio Oliva. Sergio Oliva was looked a little bloated and kind of smooth. I was going to ask you, Jerry, who do you think between him and Sergio? You think Pearl deserved that over Sergio? On uh, that contest, I'd give Bill Pearl an edge. Okay. Because if you look at all the comparison shots, especially Relax, Sergio was actually bigger, much bigger than Bill Pearl. Bill, I mean, Sergio's arms, he dwarfed even Bill Pearl's arms and his legs and stuff, and he had great pec. But he looked very smooth. He had almost no abdominal, still had a small waist, Sergio, but he was smooth. He had all the body parts, he had the symmetry, but he was smooth. And Bill Pearl, for his physique, was in relatively peak condition. And Reg Park wasn't at his best either. Reg Park was in great shape for his age, but he wasn't at, at his best. So I, I would have given it to... Uh, to Bill Pearl. Now, Frank Zane said later on, he won the short man's division in, in that year, the pressure, uh, Nat Peepers. Frank Zane has always said, he's kind of annoyed because he said two things. He said, first, they never, they refused to compare me with Bill Pearl. In other words, normally they compare the short class. Ian would know this better than me. I've never been at the Nabi universe, but when they're determining the overall winner, from what I understand, they compare all the class winners yeah. to see who, to see right. who would be the overall winner. That's what I understand. I, again, I've never seen the show. They didn't do it that year. And Frank Zane could always wondered why they never directly compared him to Bill Pearl. And Frank Zane also said that when they had, you know, they had, had you turn to the left, turn to the right to show sides of your body. Bill Pearl refused. I can't remember if it was the left or the right side of his body. The, the judges said, Everybody turned to your right, and Bill Pearl looked at them and said, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in other words, he, he, he felt that you know, turning to the right side was, was, that, was not a good look. He actually said no to the judges. Now, you know, to me, that would be a, a immediate disqualification. You know, it's like Mike Tyson biting a you know, uh, 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 Holofield's ear off. I mean, the fight was over right there, mm -hmm. but uh, nothing happened. The, the contest, they did, they went along with it. Everybody turned to the right and Bill Pearl stood where he was. Hmm. So, you know, I don't want to say that the contest was fixed because, you know, if Bill Pearl was in really bad shape, I'd say, ah, that was a definitely a fixed contest, but he was in good shape. He was in probably the best shape of his life, but still there was a couple of funny things going on. And I know that the British judges absolutely adored Bill Pearl. He was loved very much by the British judges. So they gave him some leeway. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Was that, was that nice. his last show, Jerry? Pardon me? Was that his last show? That was his last show. Okay, that's he did, what I thought. He did, he did one or two exhibitions after that, and that was it. How and old he did, was he? I'm sorry, how old was he? How, when he how old was he, was he Was his last show? Uh, I, I believe he was 42. Oh, wow. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That was 71, 71, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 41 or 42. That's right. Okay. Yeah. 41, actually. He was born in 1930, so he's 41. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was his last show. And uh, he told me himself, uh, he, he mentioned to me, he says, you know, the only reason I competed in that last universe is I had no interest in the title, no interest in the trophy. I didn't, couldn't care less. He said, I already had three universe titles. He said, but the gym had just opened up in Pasadena. He actually did it to publicize his gym. Mm -hmm. That was the only reason for entering the universe. That's what he told me himself. You know, he, he, you know, and you see the story, like I see online the other day, some people were saying, Bill Pearl competed uh, because he wanted, uh, he challenged Arnold, Sergio Oliva, and all the others to meet with him in London to see who the, that was, that was a BS story. That was mm -hmm. bullshit. That never happened. He competed only to, to basically for a business reason at first, Jim. That was the mm. only reason. You, know, you get all these myths that develop, you know? Yeah. Oh. I, I met Bill Pearl at um, one of the Arnold Classics I did. I believe it was, was either 98 or 95. And mm. um, I spoke with him for probably 45 minutes to an hour. And he was a lot, he was a really nice guy, man. Really nice. Very, yeah. 
very um, personable and very down to earth, you know, so I can understand why people liked him. Mm -hmm. Oh, very, uh, people, uh, I mean, Bill Pearl was universally liked. He treated everybody nice. Bill Pearl always remembered, I, I didn't see him very much over the years, but always remembered me, always asked me how, how I was doing, you know, and nicest guy. I mean, I've never seen him act nasty to anybody, anybody. Mm -hmm. Very nice guy, you know, uh, in case you guys are wondering, what happened to him was uh, he kind of kept it uh, to himself. He only, only a couple of people knew about it. He had Parkinson's disease for the last couple of years. And uh, you don't die from Parkinson's disease. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't mm -hmm. have it. But it has a lot of symptoms. You get like tremors. It's caused by a destruction of certain cells in the brain called, called the, uh, the uh, substantia nigra. It's called that produce dopamine. They kind of die out. And because of the lack of dopamine, you get a number. You can't, your body gets very stiff. You have trouble walking. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the, the real main problems with Parkinson's for a guy Bill Pearl's age, 90, 91 years of age, was when you have Parkinson's, you have balance problems. You can fall down really easy. And when you're 91, you know, you fall down, it's, it's much more serious than a younger person because of the lack of bone mass, you know, even a guy like Bill Pearl. But the actual main reason, the thing that really kills most people with Parkinson's is they have this, well, where's that noise coming from? That's mine. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Jerry. Okay. Uh, boy, these microphones pick up everything. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, uh, what happens with Parkinson's, the, the, the usual cause of death, 70% of people die. And I, I think this is probably what happened with Bill Pearl. They can't swallow properly. They lose the ability to swallow, so they get what they call aspiration pneumonia. Mm. The food gets in their lungs, and it's like choking them to death. Wow. That actually kills them. I suspect, I don't know this for sure, but considering that 70% of people who die from Parkinson's, that's the actual immediate cause of death. I suspect that's what happened. Now, Bill Pearl was amazing because you, know, you guys might have known about, what, a year or two ago? He was on his, uh, uh, he has like a farm up in Oregon somewhere. He had a, he turned his barn into a gym. You know, he was still training six days a week and like nine years old. And amazing. He used to get up at five o'clock in the morning and wow. do a two hour workout. Although towards the end, he had cut it to three days a week from what I understand. He had cut it down. But the thing is, he was on some sort of little tractor or something. And the, and the thing like toppled over on top of him. And he broke a couple of bones in his back. So he had to be in the hospital. When I, and when I read that, I had real, I said, oh my God, Bill's going to, I mean, Bill Pearl, he's not going to make it, man. He's 90 years old and that, that would kill an older man. But, you know, mm -hmm. that's hard. So, but he actually survived that. And, and to make it even more amazing, it, when he was in the hospital, he got a bacterial infection called Pseudomonas. You know, that's, that when you get an uh, infection in the hospital, they call it a nosal pulmonary infection meaning you get it from being in the hospital. Right. Now, again, when you get older, your immune system goes down. In fact, you might've heard the expression, he or she died of old age. Have you heard that mm -hmm, expression? Mm -hmm. No such thing as dying of old age. There's no, 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 there's no death man that comes in and you know, with <laughs> black robes and the specter and says, okay, guy, you have to come with me. It doesn't happen. There has to be, there has to be a cause of death. So. Most pe older people, you find that the majority of them, you know what their cause of death is? They get a, a pneumonia, not necessarily aspiration. They get pneumonia. And the reason they get pneumonia is because their immune system is so minimal that the, the germ or the virus or whatever that causes pneumonia, the body can't fight it and it kills them. The mm -hmm. same pneumonia that kills an older person, guys your age, my age, younger people, wouldn't, it wouldn't do it. I mean, it would make you sick but you would never die from it. Right. But an older person doesn't have, let's say, assets to deal with it. So Bill Pearl, that's another, that amazed me when I read that, he survived an infection. That shows you all those years of training. And he was a kind of a, uh, he was what they call a lacto-oval vegetarian. He cut meat out like 30 years ago. He cut mm -hmm. all red meat out. Uh, he only, his only protein source were milk and eggs. He told me off the record that the reason he did that was not necessarily health. He was involved uh, at the time. He was uh, he got involved in, in racing bicycles. He went all the way down to 185 pounds in body weight, and he was you know put on the bicycle shorts. He was racing, and he was noticing a lot of pain in his foot. It turns out he had gout, 
Now, a lot of people don't know this, but Bill Pro was actually a Native American. He kept it hit for years. He used to say he was Scotch, Irish, British descent. He said that, he said that because of the, there was a huge amount of racial discrimination against Native Americans, so he kept it low. Later on, he came out and admitted that he was a, he was a Yakima Indian, or he was from mm-hmm. the state of, he was a Native American. Now, Native Americans have a genetic tendency to get gout, and that's what Bill Pearl had, and that's from a, 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 a what happens is you get uric acid crystallization in joints, causes severe pain, especially in the toe, like a big toe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Pearl's a smart guy. He reasoned. He said, you know what? He says, since meats, you know, like liver, sweet bread, since they all high in uric acid, I'm just going to cut out all meat and become, a, you know, I, I want the protein. So I'm going to just, I'm cutting out all meat. I'm just going to, and all, all I'm going to eat for my protein is milk and eggs. And that's what he did. So, you know, Bill Pearl, uh, you know, he, he, he was, uh, like I said, pretty healthy guy. Unfortunately, he got that Parkinson's. And I'm not really sure what, I don't think anyone really knows. He, you know, the kid has mm-hmm, many, many mm-hmm. environmental toxins can cause uh, Parkinson's. There's a drug they do inject in animals that immediately causes Parkinson's disease. Certain, oh, certain, wow. certain recreational drugs. Now, Bill Pearl was not this. <laughs> Because Bill Pearl, believe me, was not a recreational drug user. I can tell you that. No, I wouldn't think so. No, he wouldn't. Even, he wouldn't even smoke a joint. Forget it. No way. Uh. Uh-uh. But there, just to make you know, just to make it complete, cocaine, speed, ecstasy, all of these things selectively destroy cells in the brain that produce dopamine. So if you use those mm-hmm. drugs, you're probably going to get Parkinson's. I don't know where Bill Pearl got it. it Might have been from environmental toxins or being up there on the farm. Who knows? But you know, he died of complications of Parkinson's. Yeah. Well, ninety one's a yeah. That's a tough life. one. Yeah. I I'd, I'd like to make it to ninety one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Would all say the same, but until you get to ninety, then you want to live a bit longer. Yeah, yeah. that may be true yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as I'm not wearing a diaper. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> You know what the research shows? The research says if you can avoid the two biggest killers, which is cardiovascular disease and cancer, you have a good chance to live to 90 and over. So, you know, if you can avoid those two, you, you, you can have a, you have a very good chance. In fact, the people that live to over mm-hmm. 100, one of the things they have in common was they never had any <clears throat> kind of cardiovascular disease or cancer. Never. Any person who lived to over 100 never had either one of them. That's an interesting mm-hmm. thing. Well, you know, was, as, a joke, as a joke, I, I thought it was in bad taste, so I, I didn't do it. But Phil, you're gonna laugh out of this. As a joke, you know, when they were uh, put, if you go on Facebook now, there's picture after picture of tribute to Bill Pearl all over the place. So as a joke, I was I, I couldn't do it because I like Bill Pearl. I, I was gonna write, I it, there you go. Steroids took the life of another body. <laughs> I mean, I was expecting some moron to put that. <laughs> yeah, I almost posted that uh, his picture with that comment. I said, I wonder how many steroid comments we're going to get don't, about this guy. Right. Anyway, don't laugh. I, I I didn't do it, but some guy actually wrote. Oh, that, I, I, I have no doubt. Yeah. yeah, some guy wrote under one of those tributes. Some guy actually wrote the steroids probably cut his life short. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> oh boy. Well, since we're on that subject, Jerry, what? So we talk about this quite often, uh, really quick. What do you what do you think's killing bodybuilders? Well, drugs. To put it in one word, you know, I mean, uh, I just saw a picture of this guy, Phil. I always remember this guy. What's that? Nick Walker. Yes. This yeah. guy, Nick Walker. Ian, I don't know if you've seen this guy, Nick Walker. Yeah. Uh, uh, I just somebody just posted a, a new photo. Mm-hmm. The guy looks like the Incredible Hulk, and I'm not exaggerating. He's extremely bulky. Mm-hmm. He looks. Like in the photo, he's got to weigh 300 pounds at least. Mm-hmm. And, and this guy's something like, what, 5'7? Yeah, I he's mean, short. Yeah, he's not. So, you know, it, it's it's the amount of drugs. I mean, I know a lot of, about the medical effects of these drugs, and they do a lot of things that, generally speaking, when you take, let's talk about anabolic steroids, for example. When you take anabolic steroids, uh, there are side effects that always occur. Yeah, because, there, that's it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's the guy. That's the guy. The photo I saw, he looked even, he looked actually about 15% bigger than that. Yeah, something like that. I mean, look mm-hmm. at this freak. 
I, I shouldn't call him that. He's probably a nice guy, but I mean, you know, I, I look at this guy and it scares me the, the amount of stuff this guy's taken. Yeah, he's huge. I mean, look at this guy. Mm-hmm. He's only like five seven. And he's only, yeah. how old is Nick now? Maybe 26, 27? 20, 27, 27, they said. Yeah. But look 27. at his forearms, man. Look at those. They're as big as most guys' legs. Look at that. Yeah, he's and a big he's boy. Got, <laughs> and he's got these varicosities on his calves in, in the front there. Yeah, you can see it in that shot. See it? Look at that. Look at those varicosities there. I mean, yeah. that cannot be healthy because varicose veins are caused by a breakdown of the valves and, and the uh, veins that help to return blood back to the heart. Mm-hmm. So basically, that's kind of like almost like stagnant blood he's got down there. He doesn't have the proper blood circulation. W- what that means in practical terms is this guy has a very, very high risk of forming a blood clot there which could travel in the lungs to his, uh, in the blood to his lungs and cause a pulmonary embolism, or it could travel to his brain and cause a, uh, a type of stroke uh, that's caused by a, a clot. Uh, I can't remember the exact name, the technical name of that stroke, but there's a stroke caused by a clot, or it could travel to the heart if you have any level of uh, you know, narrowing of the arteries, artery uh, atherosclerosis. If the clot gets in there, it blocks the blood circulation to the heart, now he has a myocardial infarction, better known as a heart. Hmm. So this guy's a walking, you know, uh, I hate to use it, but walking dead man. I mean, I wish the guy the best. I don't know the man. I, I don't want to put him, I've never met him. I, I know I sound a little critical. I, I'm saying this only because I don't think these guys realize the danger that they're in or they don't care. I think Phil and mm-hmm. Ian, you agree with me. I don't think they care about the danger. They just want to win at any cost. I'm sure that this guy, uh, who was just Nick Walker, is aware of this problem he has. Maybe he's already had symptoms, but they want to win and they don't give a crap what happens after that. You know, mm. so basically, uh, but as I was saying earlier, when you take the drugs normally, uh, when you get off them, uh, there's always side effects. For example, oral steroids. You know, if you take one or two tablets, you know, nothing's going to happen, no matter which, except for maybe Anadrol for a few not going to cause any problems but nobody takes one tablet they always take a lot more than that they take 10 times or 20 times more when you're taking that kind of dosage every human who takes that kind of dosage is going to get an inflammation of the liver it's called chemical hepatitis hepatitis is just a general term meaning inflammation mm-hmm. and now you know that's it that that would happen it's, it, it has to do with when you when the liver gets inflamed it impedes the flow of bile. Bile is produced in the liver, goes through channels in the liver, and then it winds up in the uh, gallbladder. Uh, the gallbladder secretes bile to help digest fats and emulsifies fat. Now, as long as you have normal circulation of bile, there's no problem. But when the liver gets swollen like that in the steroids, the channels that the bile, you know, travel in get kind of locked up. The bile gets, you know, it can't go, it can't move along. So now the bile builds up in the liver and starts to destroy liver cells, hepatocytes. Mm. And that's when you start to get liver problems. Now, the good news is that most bodybuilders don't stay on the oil. This, is a, this, a, this process takes a little longer though, maybe a, maybe a couple of months before that starts to happen. The bodybuilders who take the steroids usually never stay on it that long. And once you get off, this is the point I was trying to make, once you get off the steroids, whether oral or injectable, most of the side effects recede. They go right back to normal elevated blood lipids, all the things that could screw you up, return to normal if you give your body a chance to heal. And I did a recent video where I was talking about this uh, technique that they're using now called cruising, I think it is. Is that the term, Phil? Cruising? Cruising, yeah. In other words, where this idea that, because bodybuilders know when you take huge amounts of steroids, you know, if you get off of cold turkey, you know, your body has stopped producing its own testosterone. And also on the steroids, you block cortisol, which is a catabolic steroid that causes muscle breakdown. If you get off the steroids cold turkey, you're going to lose a lot of muscle very fast, and you know they, it's, 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 and you get you get depressed, you get a lot of symptoms. So you know you have a choice. You can go with they call post cycle therapy, like HCG Clomid, to try and get your natural testosterone to start working again. But somebody came up with the idea. One of these coaches probably. Uh, why get off steroids at all? You know, just get on a low dose steroid program. In other words, take testosterone 
Take the same amount of testosterone that a guy on testosterone replacement therapy is taking, maybe 100, 200 milligrams a week. It'll be enough to keep the muscle so you don't have to go through all that. You don't have to go on post-cycle therapy. Mm -hmm. Now, the, what I said in my video, the problem with that is that, you know, uh, if you're an older guy who's lacking testosterone already, those are the guys that are actually on testosterone replacement therapy. Nothing's going to happen. It's true. It, it's, it's, it, you take a low dose. It's, it's actually not going to hurt you, right? Mm -hmm. However, if you're a young guy, let's say you're uh, 25 to 30 years old, and you've been on a heavy uh, steroid cycle, and you do this cruising thing where you take 200 milligrams, uh, 300 milligrams a week of testosterone, never get off it, and then jump right back on a heavy st uh, steroid cycle, let's say three, four months later, what's happening is you've never given your body a chance to regenerate its own testosterone. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna cause permanent infertility. So if you're ever gonna want children, it's not gonna happen. Mm. It's not gonna happen. One possible solution would be for them to take HCG while they're on the testosterone because HCG will maintain the testes will and possibly, and uh, they might have to take another drug called FSH to keep the sperm production growing. You know, but the thing is that it's not a good idea. And the other bad thing is, and this is recently discovered, they didn't know this for a long time. When you take huge amounts of anabolic steroids and growth hormone also, you change the structure of the heart. In other words, the left ventricle gets much bigger and you also change the, the, the actual, what they call the, uh, uh, the, the cardiac muscle cells. They, they get this strange appearance. It's, you know, it's kind of like a, a permanent change, an ultra structural change in the heart, which is permanent, permanent. That's for life. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you. Nobody knows at this point what that's, what's gonna happen to these guys in the future. Uh, they, you know, nobody knows what's gonna happen, but you know, those kind of changes in the heart, I do know are associated with a congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure occurs in about 40% of old people anyway, even if they never take any drug. Usually it's caused by a lack of exercise and poor nutrition over the years, especially having longstanding hypertension, high blood pressure. But you know, I think my theory, again, I have no evidence for this, is that these guys that are taking the huge amounts of steroids and growth hormone, they're messing up their heart and they're gonna, they're gonna have premature deaths. I don't know when, but you know, if you add other drugs that have much more immediate danger, such as diuretics and clenbutyl in large mm -hmm, doses, mm -hmm. combine that with the steroids and the growth hormone, now you have the guys that drop dead in the hotel room two days before the show or something like that. Or <clears> you <throat> see online, Joe Schmielecki, a, a 28 year old pro bodybuilder was found dead. That's the guys that, you know, because that stuff will kill you at the snap of a finger. So that, that, that's what's happening with the, it's, it's very bad. These guys, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, I, I, I think I did one with Phil where I mentioned that they should have, the least they can do is make sure they're under some sort of medical, so not the coaches. They don't, these guys are not trained in medicine. They got to go to real doctors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we've talked about that. Doctors. Yeah, they got to have regular lab tests. And I'm talking about if you're on a high dose steroid, I'd say no less than once a month or even twice a month, have the lab test done. This way you can, you can see, like for example, the liver enzymes, if they're going through the ceiling, you better cut down on those oral steroids or you're gonna be screwed up. Mm -hmm. And you get, you get the warning signs. And if you do it that way, you have much greater chance of survival. If you mm -hmm. don't you just go fly by the seat of the pants, like they say, anything can happen. You know, they're, they're mm -hmm. on their own. Yeah. 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 Crazy, crazy stuff. Yeah. Well, so are you uh, are you keeping up with a lot of the today's bodybuilders like Big Rami and all that? Well, I'm not into it like I used to be. In other yeah. words, uh, I, I don't I, I don't even know if mag <laughs> I don't even know if bodybuilding magazines exist. The last I was gonna I say it's all on. Well, I mean, you just look on Instagram now and and whatever. Yeah. I, I yeah, but what I understand, most of the magazines have gone uh, into a, a digital, uh, yeah. form, which is understandable because, like everything else, the cost of paper. Even when I was still writing, I remember John Balick. I was writing for Iron Man magazine. He was telling me how the cost of the paper for the magazine is like tripled, mm -hmm. and that that was what 15 years ago. So, I can just imagine what it is now. It's almost prohibitively expensive. 
to put out a, a paper uh, magazine publication. So, mm-hmm. you know, the rest went digital, but I, like other people, I, I see what I see online. I see some pictures of these guys. I, mm-hmm. I don't like, I, I don't know the new guys at all though. I don't know any of them. You know, I was long gone. I stopped writing for Weeder in the late nineties. That's when I stopped going to the major contests. So the new guys, the only guys who know me are the guys who were around in the uh, late 90s, mm-hmm. early, mm-hmm. early 2000s, you know, Flex, uh, uh, Lavoni, those guys, Dorian, you know, those guys know me. These uh, new guys, uh, I was surprised that Phil Heath knew who I was. So that surprised me. He, mm-hmm. he, or I, when I met him, I mentioned, oh, so I've been reading his stuff for years. That surprised me. That caught me off guard because I hadn't written, as I said, I hadn't had a magazine article published in years. And yet he knew who I was. He mm-hmm. was an older magazine, so. But so, uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, I used to actually watch the Olympia when they had it on uh, the internet and the Arnold show. Mm-hmm. And then I, I'll be honest, I can't lie. I kind of lost interest in that too. You know, I just, I mean, I, I've just, I mean, I love working out. I'm still into it and stuff like that. But the bodybuilding aspect of it has, let's say it's greatly decreased. Mm-hmm. And I, like I say, I have mixed feelings about today's bodybuilding. Because I was a former bodybuilder myself, and you know Phil and Ian can understand this too. I appreciate you yourself. I mean, you train. Mm-hmm. I, I, I appreciate on the on the level of a bodybuilder, hardcore bodybuilder, let's say. I appreciate the level of muscle mass, regardless of how they got it. I look at a guy like Ronnie Coleman and Jake Cutler, and this other guy I just mentioned. I mean, uh, and Big Ramey, and another freak. I mean, I look at them size, and I say, holy shit. I, it's absolutely these guys are just wonders of nature drugs are not i mean big Ramey's walking around 330 pounds i mean it's just it's freakish you know what i mean on the other hand that's the bodybuilder side of me mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the person that's uh, an older guy now who just trains for health looks at these guys and, and yearns for the days when they had for uh, symmetrical proportionate physiques that the, the public could at least slightly relate to mm-hmm. because the way, especially professional bodybuilding, the way it is today, it, it's always, I mean, it's always going to be a kind of a, I don't want to call it a cult, but let's say a niche activity, which only interests people that are into the, you know, super hardcore muscle. It's never going to grow. In other words, it, it's it, it, as long as it has this look today and to make it worse, and I hope this isn't true, if bodybuilders continue to check out every so often, male or female or both, if they you know you still see these deaths occurring, that's going to really turn off everybody, and it's it's, it's even going to turn off potential bodybuilders. Even bodybuilders that are thinking of competing will look at that and say, "Wait a minute, you know, if like ten bodybuilders in a row drop dead, some of these men and women will say, "Wait, whoa, whoa, whoa." whoa. I'm not going to get into something where like it could kill me. I want to compete, but I don't want to put my life on the line. I think a Jay Cutler, who was four-time Mr. Olympia, he said bodybuilding has become a, uh, what do you call it? A, a, a life-risking sport. That's the word. In other words, it's a, you're, you're basically putting your life at risk. And it was never like that. I don't think Ian experienced that. It, filled it. it was never like that. I mean, you know, and, and I've said this publicly on in, in the various uh, videos and podcasts and in my newsletter, I've always pointed out that, you know, people have to understand weight training and bodybuilding is a very good thing. And Bill Paul tried to say this too. If you engage in weight training and you uh, use the associated good nutrition that's needed to build muscle, it's one of the best things you could do. I mean, it, all the medical journals, which I follow, they have dozens of articles about how, you, you know, the loss of muscle, the medical term is sarcopenia, cuts your life short because when you get frail, the whole body, it's like a building slowly falling apart. Everything falls apart. You can't walk, you can't eat right, you know, this and that. You know, people need, need to understand, they have to separate bodybuilding and weight training from the competitive side, especially the professional side. They're two different animals. So nobody should be discouraged from engaging at any age, by the way, because I get a lot of, uh, you know, emails and, and people ask me on Facebook and other social media, oh, I'm, I'm 50 years, 60 years old. And, you know, I trained as a kid, but, you know, then I got married and got a job and, 
had to give up uh, working out. Is it too late? No, it's not too late. It's never too late. And this is shown in medical studies. They did studies at Tufts University years ago. They had people that were Bill Pearl's age, 90, 91 years old. These people were so frail, Jason, they couldn't walk. They had walkers and canes. They couldn't even walk. They put them on a weight training program. Admittedly, mm -hmm. it was light. It light. They did like light weights, 20, 30 reps, right? right and they, right. Did it they did it to failure, right? All of these people, the guys that walkers and canes, threw them away. They started walking like young mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. Their health improved. Cardiovascular symptoms went down to nothing. Diabetes disappeared. And they didn't do any robot. It was all weight training. Mm -hmm. That's how beneficial weight training is. So there's no age limit. Now, I'm not going to lie to people. If you're over 60, you know, you're not going to get the same rate of speed of development as you did when you're 25. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill, I am probably all trained. You train. I mean, you look a little younger than us, uh, Jason. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old you are, but the thing is, I got to tell you, at my age, it's a, I don't put much muscle on at all. Mm -hmm. I'm happy. I'm, I, I consider keeping as, as any muscle I have. That makes me happy. That's enough mm -hmm. of me. I don't want to lose muscle. My main goals are to maintain as mus much muscle as I, as I want. Mm -hmm. The only thing that slightly discourages me is my strength. It's called, it's called uh, uh, what's the name? Uh, I can't remember it's a medical term, but there's a loss of strength. Actually, the loss of strength with age is even worse than the loss of muscle. Mm -hmm. But the is I, I've gotten much weaker in my ego. I used to be strong. I was a, even though I didn't th to take steroids. When I trained in my 20s, I was on you, even Arnold was amazed. I used to do presses behind the neck with 315. I did 605 pounds squat. I was very strong. So my ego suffers because <laughs> the weights I have a, I have severe arthritis in both my shoulders. The mm. limits, I, pressing kills me. I can't even raise my arm all the way up. My, I have severe uh, arthritis in my knees. So forget about heavy leg works. Forget about squats. I can't even hold the bar behind my neck. So, you know, the, the loss of strength, <clears throat> I, I admit it, it bothers me. It, it really does. Because, you know, one of the things I loved about training was getting stronger. You know, when you were younger, you could, you know, adding more weight. You could just, it was a real ego trip. That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> you know? It seems like I'm getting weaker with each year, but hopefully I can stave stave it off enough to at least keep most of what I have. You know, hmm. actually, my uh, Dr. Jason's texting me right now. I was just thinking uh, we need to have a show with Jerry and Dr. Jason on Absolutely. together. Yeah. That that'd be really good. Yeah, Who's Dr. Jason? Yeah. Do I know? Uh, he's on our podcast. He has a, a anti aging clinic down here in Florida. He's kind of like the the doctor for all the most of the local bodybuilders and stuff down here. Oh, what's so, his last name? Uh, Skodal. Skodal, I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, do you pronounce it Shotel? Or is it, yeah, Shotel or Skodal? I, I can't remember exactly, but it's anti aging and rejuvenative work. So he's in Daytona. Is he an MD? Yeah, he's an MD. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, very, very clever guy. Very yeah. clever. Yeah, yeah. We talk. Uh, Usually, like these, we've been doing podcasts on autopsies and stuff, and he'll go through the autopsies and stuff and talk about all the. Did you ever have one thing that I'm curious about? And you know, you, it's, you don't see it as much now as it, a couple of years ago. The, that big mystery about that bloated gut look. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of people wonder about that. You know, it's something that didn't exist in Ian's time and Phil, Phil's time. In my time, nobody had bloated guts. You know, the, we, we had this weird look. You have a big guy. And he has, yeah. when, he falls the ab, when they call for an ab shot, he's got thick abs. When he stands relaxed, it sticks out like a pregnant woman. Is that from and the you, growth hormone? You think that's, you think that's insulin, Jerry, or, or growth hormone? Well, Dorian Yates has come out publicly and said, you know, because he had a little bit of a belly, if you remember his last three, two or three yeah, years. Yeah. And he said, he publicly has said that he didn't get that till he added insulin to his uh, anabolic stat. So he thinks insulin is the cause. It could be. Uh, I kind of think that it's a combination of all three. I think it's a large uh, high dose steroids, uh, high dose growth hormone and insulin. I think that it, it causes this weird kind of uh, belly appearance. Uh, you know, some people think it's visceral fat because that's the deep lying fat. You can have deep lying fat and still have abs. And if you get enough visceral fat, theoretically, you could push your stomach out. 
Mm-hmm. So I don't, again, you'd have to have certain tests to determine that. And to my knowledge, nobody's ever done that. So I, you know, it's all theoretical. I don't think anybody really knows. But what I do find interesting is that I, some of the, I have seen photos and videos of some of the more recent pro shows. And now it seems much, you notice this, Phil? It seems much rarer than it was a couple of years ago. You don't see a lot. There's still a couple of guys that have the bellies, Mm -hmm. but it's much less prevalent than it was a couple of years ago. I don't know what these guys, maybe their coaches are doing something different. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they're doing different, but they're doing something that, that's uh, obviously they got a flat, a lot of flat. Even Arnold, public mm-hmm. state, I mm-hmm. thought it was disgusting that, that these guys are competing with, you know, big belly sticking out, you know. So, yeah, I think since classic physique has started being getting more popular, I think it's kind of been going away. Well, some people predict that classic physique is going to take over uh, and that, uh, you know, that uh, mm-hmm. pro, uh, the, the direction that pro body has gone. Mm-hmm. Going to take the same route as the dinosaurs, <laughs> you know. It's it's going to become extinct. Well, well, I mean, if you think about it, I don't know if it if it's because Big Remy's not here, but more people talk about Chris Bumstead than they do Remy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you know that that the reason for that is what I said earlier because people can relate. You know, whether it's bodybuilders or average people on the street, mm-hmm. people can relate more to a Bumstead physique. The man is undoubtedly muscular. Mm-hmm. He's got a. I met him a couple. The nice guy. He's got yeah. a tremendous physique, you know. But in other words, it doesn't look like it's art. Like it doesn't look bloated mm-hmm. or, or completely out of proportion to human on a human scale. In other words, it, it looks like it. It could be attainable. So the truth is, it's not attainable by most people, but they don't know that. Yeah. I mean, with Chris, like most champion bodybuilders, you have to have a certain level of genetics. To, you know, yeah. no amount of training. I think you guys would agree no amount of training or diet is going to give you the uh, appearance uh, of a of a champion elite bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. You can vastly improve your physique, <clears throat> but unless you have, have the, the genetics that make a champion bodybuilder, there's not much you can do. Like Boyer Co. is a good example. Boyer was a great bodybuilder, but he never got abdominals. He just, they weren't there. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to do. That was his a genetic flaw, you know. Then you have mm-hmm. the black body bullets, you have the calf problem. Mm-hmm. You know, they train their calves, but they just there's not the muscle fibers aren't there. There's nothing they could do. Yeah. So this is where genetics play a role in uh in bodybuilding, you know. Yeah. Yep. Oh, I know. I'm I'm almost six four. I my I, my calves are are just long. You know, they're there. They're just yeah. I I never had great calves either. I mean, mm-hmm. I just a, just a genetic, but I work them. And, you know, I work them almost calves, every day. Yeah. Well, I mean, my calves have definitely improved. In fact, I can tell you when they closed the gyms, I remember when they closed them for the with the COVID nineteen. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You know, I for a while I was trained. Well, actually, I trained this gym for a year and a half, a little private training gym. They didn't have a calf machine, so what I did is I did uh, an old exercise I did way back when I was younger. I did one legged standing calf raises, body weight. I, I didn't even hold the weight in my hand. I just did body weight because I didn't want my calves to atrophy any more than they did, mm-hmm, especially mm-hmm. because I have to understand when you get older, your muscles atrophy at a, at a at a blazing speed. If you don't work out, younger guys can get away with not training for a while and lo- hardly lose any muscle. A guy over 60, it's like I compare it to butter. <laughs> yep, it's like butter melting on a hot plate. Mm. I'm, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, two weeks after, that, and the first muscles to go, are the forearm, the peripheral muscles, the forearms and the calves. Those are the first muscles to atrophy, uh, you mm-hmm. know, anybody, in anybody. But uh, after two weeks of no training, I looked at my calves and they were already looked like they lost an inch and I freaked out. I started doing these one-legged calf raises mm-hmm. and, it, and it did, it stopped the muscle loss, but my calves were still small the whole time. Now I went back to uh, Gold's Gym where they do have calf machines and I started doing calf work on my leg knees and I'm telling you, I, I actually put back about two inches on my calves, wow. even at my age. Wow. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you my calves are big. I mean, when I wear shorts and look in the, you walk by a, you know, a window where I could see my legs, I feel like dropping to the floor and, and bawling my eyes out. <laughs> I used to have big legs. My legs look like sticks now, and my calves <laughs> follow. You know, I mean, they don't look big. They're cut, but they don't look big. Mm-hmm. And the thing is that my point is that if you train your calves, no matter how bad your genetics, 
you're going to get a certain amount of improvement. But unless you have a, mm -hmm. a genetic the calves, and Jesus, there's guys who have calf genetics that had great calves without ever doing calf work. Chris Dickerson, Mike Matarasso, gigantic mm. calves. They never trained their calves. And they, they I look at guys' calves, calves all the time. They don't even know. And I, I just, I get pissed yeah. off sometimes. Oh, yeah. Go down, go to the beach sometimes on a hot yeah. day. And you, you'll see fat guys walking along right. the beach. 20 you know, inch calves. <laughs> I, I know the exact feeling. I know the exact feeling. Aggravates the hell out of me. Big fat slobs. Are, I mean, I mean, the fat hanging or jiggling everywhere. They have, they don't have pecs. They have tits for crying They're walking down the beach. But then you look at their calves. They got the big, giant, oh, it looks like a 20 inch calf. And not only that, but they have the diamond. They even have the definition of the yeah. calf. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've seen <laughs> I swear to you, I want to jump on these guys and start beating the fuck out of them. <laughs> I had exact feeling. You see that all the time. I see that every day. Yeah. Oh, man. Every day. I remember, hey, I remember the first time I, I met Dorian Yates. The first time I met these, Ian, you, you'll like this story. I was at the Night of the Champions contest, 1990. I think it was first American contest. It was won by uh, Momo Benaziz. Uh, uh, Dorian got second. I was in the hotel, walking to the lobby, and Peter McGuff calls me over. He says, Jerry, I want you to meet this friend of mine from Britain. And I said to myself, okay, uh, you know, Peter, uh, he's British, and, you know, he loves the British body. It was probably going to be some, some mediocre guy, and I have to make believe I think the guy's good, you know. <laughs> so, this is what I was thinking on the elevator. <laughs> so, so we go in the room, and I see this woman sitting on the chair, you know, and it turns out to be his then fiance he married her later later and then got divorced and he had a kid with her can't remember her name but anyway uh he's in a bathroom dorian and uh so peter says jerry this is dorian yates from uh, you know i said nice meeting dorian you, you know i i know you're, you're you're competing right he said yeah he says uh and uh, so peter says dorian show him your physique so dorian takes off his bathroom he has posing trunks on and i look at him and right away i see this i was stunned I didn't expect a physique like that. I mean, mm. right away, I, have, I said to Peter, right in front of Dorian, I said, why haven't I heard of this guy? My God, he, he, this guy looks like Mr. Olympia already. Then I looked at his calves, and that's when I almost, I had to almost sit down. I freaked out. I said, those calves, and I said this to Dorian Yates, those are genetic calves. Tell me those are genetic calves. <laughs> would, I, they were huge and cut and big, and, you know, huge. He says, no, no. He says, uh, Jordan says, I had small calves when I began training. I said, really? He says, yeah, they were only 17 and a half. <laughs> only. <laughs> yeah. Only and 17 I, and a half. <laughs> 17 and a half. You know, Dorian had like 21 inch calves there. 17 and a half calves to him were, were, were small. Small, yeah. yeah. People have quads but, that big. Yeah, yeah. So I said to him, Dorian, I hate to break the news to you, but if calves are considered pretty good sized calves for most normal men, and he just laughed, you know. Mm -hmm. So you know, mm. that was that was the first time I met Dorian Yates. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh well, cool, Jerry. Man, I I know we could go on forever, and uh, I, I definitely want to set up if you if you're able to, maybe one of these days, uh, another one with you in the dock, or like a Q and A type thing. Yeah, sure. Yeah, because we I know we get a lot of fans that have some questions and stuff. I love to pick your brain. Do they? Do they? You have? Do you have like a call-in system where they send you advanced questions? No, nah, we I usually know. just I usually just post them. Like uh, when I have an upcoming show, just post questions oh, and, okay. the, and they send them. Okay, that, that's yeah, kind of like how Palumbo does it. He does the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. See, so. I haven't seen I haven't seen Palumbo's. He still has his. Uh, yeah, he his, still uh, has his. Uh, his he's got. A couple shows now. I know he does the regular one with his uh, his normal crew with Ray Romano, um, okay. and then he does uh, him and uh, Chris Aceto, oh, and then, okay. and then uh, uh, Lee Priest is pretty big into. Uh, oh, okay. He has a show yeah. with him. Yeah, I have for some reason I haven't seen any Palumbo's videos in over a year. I don't know why. Yeah. Show up on my YouTube when I go into YouTube. Yeah, so they give me some videos. This is never there. I don't know. I, I didn't block them or anything. Huh. They just don't, you know. Yeah, so, it's weird how that uh, what's that called? The algorithm or whatever it's called, how it works. Yeah, yeah. he said a couple of things. I mean, I like Dave, I know him for many years, but he said a couple of things. Mm. Uh, I couldn't tell you offhand, I don't remember, 
he said quite a few things I, I, I disagreed with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, nothing serious, but, you know, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. he says, you know, but he's, he's, I have no problem. With no, I, I, I feel the same way. I, I get along with him and I, I think he's, he says some stuff, but I mean, that's why these are called opinions, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No problem with that. Yeah. You know, I, I can't, think, I can't think of anybody. Uh, so we'll get a laugh about this. I, I can't think of anybody in the entire world of bodybuilding that I completely dislike and detest except for one person. And that is uh, uh, Steve Blackman. You know who he is? Oh, <laughs> oh, uh, oh yeah. Oh, the uh, Palumbo and them, they pick on him a lot. Yeah, hey, he used my picture yeah. in one of his ads, a full page picture. Yeah. For years. Yeah. And it's doing an archer pose from the back. And I posted that on my Instagram. He used yeah. that for about two years. And I looked at it and I kept saying, well, that's me. But I'm thinking to myself, I don't, I didn't take a picture for him. So how did right. I, it didn't make sense to me. I didn't know they could that you know, Photoshop, mm -hmm. whatever they do, mm -hmm. are able to do. But yeah. he did that to me and for a two year period. Well, let me put it this way. The reason why I, I without going through a lot of detail, the reason why I don't like Blackman is because, you know, Joe Weider was a funny guy. I mean, he lied to me a lot, you know, uh, like one time I was over his house, he used to like to meet people outside his house. He had a little uh, backyard and uh, a little table and chair set up. He didn't want anyone to go in his home because he had this expensive artwork, you know, these rugs that cost a million dollars hanging up and painting. He felt that anyone going in the house would get the idea of robbing. And so if anybody, he would meet him on the outside. So I, I was sitting with him outside and, uh, we were talking, I don't remember the topic, but he says to me, Joe Weider says, he says, he says, Jerry, when have I, he says, Jerry, when have I ever lied to you? He goes like that. I said, Joe, and I looked at my watch. I said, I don't think we have enough time. He laughed, he laughed, he laughed, mm. you know, he laughed, you know, so, so and then he says to me, he said, Jerry he says, he says, I'm a Jewish guy like you. He says, I would not, you think I would cheat another Jewish guy? I said, again, Joe, you really want an answer? <laughs> <laughs> he laughed again. So, but my point is, Joe, you know, you mm -hmm. can see him coming from a mile away. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you know, it's like Donald Trump. I mean, nobody's really fooled who has any kind of brain about Donald Trump. You see where the guy's coming from, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, this guy, Blackman, he tried to make himself appear sincere. You know what I mean? Like, like, uh, all you know, you'll always, he said to me, you'll always have a home and muscular development as his magazine and this and that. And he was new this. Uh, he, I, I wrote for him for a, a couple of years. Um, you know, he, he, he lied about everything and, and he was uncommunicative. I mean, I, go, I can go on and on. The guy is, let me put it this way in one sentence, he has zero integrity, zero. Joe kept some of his promises to me, not all, but he at least kept his word on some things. Blackman didn't on anything. So for that reason, I still, after all these years, I dislike Blackman. I think he's a horrible person. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. Terrible. I've heard several I, people talk about him. I said, hey, that, I, I, wait, I said that on Palumbo's show. I said it on, you know, uh, it yeah. was me, Palumbo, and uh, 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 Aceto. And, and they asked me the question, who were the worst and best publishers? Uh, and bodybuilding publishers, you know, it's a couple of years ago. I said, well, the best is maybe Joe Weider because he's the one that really got bodybuilding on the road, so to speak, you know. The worst is easy, easy question. It's uh, Steve Blackman. And, and, and Palumbo, who, didn't, who doesn't like Blackman, his jaw dropped, by the way. And so he <laughs> was shocked that I said that. And I told him exactly what I told you. I said, he has no I said he's a scumbag. And mm -hmm. Palumbo actually tried to defend him. I said, yeah. well, you know, what can I say, Dave? That's your opinion. I think he's trash. What mm -hmm. can I tell you? Hey, hey, Jerry, let me ask you this. Yeah. The one lie that Joe told you, were you in the will? Ah, although that, you know that story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We laughed yeah. about that. Oh, yeah. Joe Weider calls me, right? He calls me when the, towards the end there. It was, uh, this is right when I stopped writing for him. This, I think this is, yeah, this is the same conversation he told me that he couldn't help me anymore against these guys that would give me a hard time. And he says to me, uh, I, I really feel bad to something. I said, don't worry about it, Joe. I appreciate you gave me work for years. I have, not, I, I have nothing but fondness for you. And then he says this, he goes, he says, by the way, I want you to know you're in my will. He, said, he, says, 
He says, you're going to be a very rich man one day. You know, it goes like that. Of course, I wasn't in his will. He didn't leave me time. You know, the, the most I got was I did attend the Joe Weedon Memorial that Arnold uh, put on to him. Mm -hmm. in a hotel. Mm -hmm. He didn't leave me. I didn't expect anything from Joe Weedon. Ever. He said the same thing to me when I was writing. Him. I was covering uh, the uh, Grand, they called the Grand Prix circuit, the pro shows in the late 80s. This one was in Cannes, France. And, I, and I, I, Joe had just come in, I flew in, and I saw him in the lobby of the hotel in conference. And he comes up to me again, he says to me, Jerry, you know what I'm gonna do? He says, I'm gonna give you a lot of stock in the company. We're expanding into other avenues. He says, in a couple of months, you'll be a multimillionaire. <laughs> Ask me if I ever got stuff. He didn't even give me a stock king much. <laughs> 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 oh man awesome i'm gonna have to go guys yeah i think we're i think we're good for now yeah i'm good hey you guys on california time we're on florida time here yeah that's right yeah okay ian you live in florida yes oh okay okay yeah, yeah, yeah. we're both in florida yeah. okay yeah but hey uh mr jerry thanks again i really appreciate come on, come on. it come yeah thanks on. jerry yeah, yeah. Let yeah, us speak we'll, to again, yeah. Well, let's yeah. do it again. Maybe uh, Jean Pierre could join us too. No, he yeah, he said for sure to uh, let you know that he's sorry he missed and he wants to he wants yeah. to talk to you. Yeah, he had an emergency. Yeah, that's all right. He's a great. I hope it's not serious though. But he's a great guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, yeah, I look forward. And also that doctor, that would be a fun show. Yeah, you know. Yeah, we'll put it together. We got a couple of other a uh, couple weeks, two or three weeks maybe. Sounds good. Okay, I'll get, I'll get back with you. Yeah, you guys know it. Phil knows how to get a hold of me. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye, guys. All right, guys. All right gentlemen. Y'all have a good evening. Thanks again, Jerry. Bye. Bye.